Let's pray, church. Father, as we prepare for the next little while to spend together in your word, I pray that you would do the work in our hearts now uh, to prepare us for that task. Father, that we would recognize today what we, what we confess and believe, but Father, that it would be on the forefront of our minds that all scripture is breathed out by you you've breathed it out, you've made it profitable for us so that we might be made complete in every way and equipped for every good work. And so, Father, I pray that you would protect us from coming to your word um, in a manner that's irreverent or light, that we would not play the part of the fool that we just read about and even come to, to this time and, and live as if you're not in the room, as if you're not present. But Father, that we would come in trembling and in humility before your word, ready to receive, receive it as what it is, the words of life unto us. And so, Father, we pray that you would open our hearts and our minds, lead us to understanding, and then lead us from that understanding of who you are and what you've revealed to us to, to faith in you, to obedience to your word to trusting and following Jesus above all else. We ask this unto his glory and in his name. Amen. Well, back in uh, 2010, uh, one of my favorite movies uh, was released. I'm a big Christopher Nolan fan, so with, uh, what he did with the Batman films, and then his, his film Inception came out that year starring Leonardo DiCaprio. And in the story, um, again, I don't feel bad we're a dozen years removed from this. If you haven't watched it, spoiler alert there for you if you need to run out of the room. But DiCaprio's character and his team have the ability to dream share. Um, and so this isn't a real thing that, w that we do, but they have a machine where they're able to enter into other people's dreams. And they're thieves. They go into these dreams in order to extract important information from people um, while they're asleep. But the story hinges on a mission they're given not to extract existing information, but to plant new information, to plant a simple idea into someone else's mind that's going to alter the course of their decision-making and their life entirely, hence the title, Inception. As once this basic and foundational idea takes root in that person's mind, everything else in that person's life is then going to be shaped by it. DiCaprio's character, Cobb, at one point says about that central idea and belief they're trying to plant, that an idea is resilient and highly contagious. Once an idea has taken hold of the brain, it's almost impossible to eradicate. Now, if we were to take Cobb a little bit further and think through this more biblically and theologically, there is no idea, there's no belief more foundational or life-shaping than what you and I believe about God. It's why A.W. Tozer in his book, Knowledge of the Holy, opened with these words. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. That's true for us individually, and it's true for us collectively as a church, that what we truly think about God and what we truly believe about God is going to affect and shape everything else in our lives, our thoughts and our words and our habits and our actions and our relationships and our worship. And that's on full display in the two Psalms before us today that Genesis read for us. Psalms 14 and 15 feature this stark contrast between the way of the fool and the wicked on one hand and then the way of the righteous on the other. But in each psalm, there is this simple and foundational idea about God that leads the, the characters down these particular paths. In Psalm 14, it begins with the fool saying and believing in his heart, there is no God, and his life flows out of that belief and that conviction. And then in Psalm 15, the righteous person lives with the conviction that not only does God exist, his name is Yahweh, and he reigns on the throne. 
And he is to be feared and followed above all. And his life is then consistent with that reality. And so as we'll seek to demonstrate this morning as we study these, I believe Psalm 15 is faithfully and ultimately lived out by the son of David, the king of Psalm 2, Jesus Christ, and that his, as his people, we are then to reflect his character and ways. So as we walk through these psalms together, we'll look closely at both of these paths. First, the, the way of the fool, the path of the fool, and then second, the way of the faithful king, and thus the way of the people who belong to him. And so, first, in Psalm 14, let us beware the way of the fool. We have here, as one scholar, Alan Ross, notes, one of the strongest passages in the Bible about the complete depravity of the human race. In it, David observes the fool and observes his life from the inside out, from his heart and how it manifests itself in the works of his hands. So pick up in verse 1. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. So note the sequence. The way of the fool begins with this simple denial either of God's existence altogether or at least of God's relevance to his life. Think about the audacity of that claim. For the creature, the one who would not exist were it not for the pure power and grace of the creator, the creature looks upon the creator and declares, you don't exist. You don't matter. There is no God. Our sin is terrifying. From the simple then and sinister declaration, total depravity, total corruption follows. Verse 2 says they are corrupt. Verse 3, they have all turned aside together. They have become corrupt. The word means ruined, devastated. It's radical corruption, meaning it goes down to the very roots of our hearts. And from this corruption then, humanity does unspeakable deeds acts of wickedness. It's such a comprehensive corruption that David declares, there is none who does good. That just doesn't seem right to us, right? Like if you're reading that, at least for me, I can think about unbelievers who reject God but do what we would say are good deeds, right? They have acts of, of kindness to others, But in God's economy, the way that God sees things, God sees to levels that we cannot and sees even the very heart and motives behind it. And for people whose hearts are so corrupt, so twisted, we in our sin don't do the things that we do unto the glory of God like we were created to. And so even our good deeds are stained with sin. They're done for motives that are less than what we were created to live for. And so in verse 2, the Lord shares the same verdict as David about humanity. It says, The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. So this language, this picture of God looking down from heaven upon the children of man and seeing their corruption, it's alluding to language from the flood narrative in Genesis 6, 11 through 12, when God sees that all flesh had corrupted their way on earth and he's going to judge them. And like Genesis 6, the language in Psalm 14 is all inclusive. All have turned aside and become corrupt. There is no one who does good, no one who understands, no one who knows God, no one who seeks after God, not even one. It's a devastating picture. Begins with this denial of God, this attempt to usurp His authority. It leads to a deficient knowledge of God Himself and the world, this delighting in evil rather than good. And then verses 4 through 6 show us the destructive end that it leads to. It says, have they no knowledge, all the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call? Deeds that the wicked do is they persecute the righteous. They're opposed to the Lord's people. 
they're portrayed as eating them up as if they're eating slices of bread. Meaning that this, you know, I don't, I don't know, maybe bread is like a big occasion for you. Like you go to the restaurant and they bring the bread out, you don't need to order, right? Like it's a big deal, like let's just go home at this point. But the point is that bread would be a common staple. This is a daily occurrence. They're not thinking much about doing this, right? It's just, it's just bread, right? And that's the way that they treat the righteous. They're eating them up as if they're just eating bread. It's not a special meal for them. This is the regular going to be served to these hungry fools. It says, verse 5, There they are in great terror, for God is with the generation of the righteous. You would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. In other words, the wicked can belittle and mock and persecute the poor. They can make fun of them for seeking the Lord as their refuge, and it seems to the wicked as if He's no refuge at all to them. They revile them for trusting in the Lord, for following His Word. But the Lord is the refuge of the poor. He is with the righteous. And as we, we've already seen throughout the book of Psalms, He will arise and vindicate His people in the end. So that leads David to cry for that deliverance in verse 7. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of His people, let Jacob rejoice, let Israel be glad. It's rendered as more of a declaration here, but it can be translated just as a question. Who will give from Zion salvation for Israel? Who will bring it? And it's a question that was answered for us back in Psalm 2, 6-9. Again, in our study of Psalms, Psalms 1 and 2 are really foundational for understanding the entire book of Psalms. They're the introduction to the Psalter. And this there that the Lord says in verses 6 through 9, Psalm 2, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. The point is that when this messianic king from David's line, the son of God, when he arises, God will bring justice and great joy to his people. Justice upon sin, deliverance for his people. We'll look more at that king in a moment. But Psalm 14, I think, calls for further reflection from us before we do. As we consider the way of the foolish person, one question we should ask is, who is this fool? Maybe you ask that a lot when you're driving and someone cuts you off, right? Who is this fool? <laughs> then don't do that. All right. But our temptation is likely when we ask that question to think first and foremost about the people out there that fit this category the people out there who explicitly reject God and do commit all kinds of evil and abuse against others. And certainly they are included and, and right in the crosshairs of this passage. This text provides us a lens through which to see the wicked, to see godless people for what they are according to God's word. They're fools according to God because they've rejected God. That's the opposite of wisdom. It reminds us that in this world, Christians should expect opposition we should not be surprised in the face of radical corruption and rampant evil. We shouldn't be shocked when that comes. We, we know it's going to happen. This is the human condition. And we trust that God will judge this wickedness when Christ returns. But this passage is more than just a lens or a window through which we look at others in the world. This passage is also a mirror in which we see ourselves. It's a mirror in which we see our own ugliness. I hope we notice this throughout this passage, is the inclusive language regarding the foolish. There is no one who does good. All have turned aside. Together they've become corrupt. Not even one does good. In Romans 3, Paul is establishing his, his argument for the universal wickedness and foolishness of humanity that it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, all are under sin, Romans 3.9. And he then quotes after that from this psalm. This is like the basis for Paul's argument. The point is that it includes every one of us in this room. Everyone that we know, everyone that has descended from our forefather Adam, 
Peter Craigie, in his commentary, put it this way, that the fool is not a rare subspecies within the human race. You don't have to look far to find one. All human beings are fools apart from the wisdom of God. And the works of the fool can never secure justification in the sight of God, devoid as they are of that loving kindness which is of the essence of God. It's bad news, friends. (laughs) We're fools. Apart from God, that's who we are. We don't seek after God on our own. We don't know God in our sin. We're blind to Him. We don't naturally do what is good and right according to God's definition. Not one of us does that. And so what hope then do we have? I think that hope is portrayed in Psalm 15. Is that we would second behold and believe in the faithful King. We could summarize Psalm 14 as the description of the one who cannot dwell with the Lord. Psalm 5.4, David said this, Evil may not dwell with you. So these evildoers, these fools, they can't dwell in the Lord's presence. That raises another question then. Who can dwell with the Lord? Who can be in His presence? Who can live in His house and not be consumed by His holy wrath against evil and sin? What are the necessary qualifications for a worshiper to enter His presence, commune with Him, and not die in the process? Well, Psalm 15 provides the answer. We'll begin with the question raised in verse 1. O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? These questions combine elements from both Psalm 5 and Psalm 2. Psalm 5, 4, as we just mentioned, says that evil cannot dwell, cannot sojourn with the Lord. Psalm 15, 1 asks that question, who shall sojourn in your tent? The answer is obviously not the evil one, not the fool of Psalm 14. The second question then asks, who will dwell on your holy hill? or on your holy mountain. Well, Psalm 2 has told us already someone who's on that holy hill, on that holy mountain. Psalm 2, 6, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill and mountain. So even though as we go through the psalm, the questions are about what kind of people can dwell in Yahweh's presence, in the foreground of the psalm is this portrait of the king who is the only one who can actually dwell in God's presence, and the only one who can lead us, lead His people to dwell in God's presence. So let's focus on four things that we see, a few things that we see of this king's character. The first thing we see is he's blameless in his walk. Verse 2, David says of him, he who walks blamelessly and does what is right. Walking is just a, like an idiomatic way of describing his, his lifestyle. So this statement means that every aspect of his life is characterized by integrity, full obedience to God. That blamelessness next is seen in his thoughts and words. Verse 2 again, he who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart, who does not slander with his tongue. The point is there's no disconnect, no contradiction between the way he walks on the outside and then his inner life. He embodies the words of Psalm 1, meditating on God's instruction day and night so that he might speak truth to his own heart rather than lies. So when temptation to sin arises, for example, he doesn't give in to the lie that it's going to bring joy and pleasure with no consequences. He speaks truth through his heart and lives according to God's word. And we see Jesus doing that in his own temptation. When he's squeezed, when he's pressed, he speaks truth, quotes the scriptures. Furthermore, he is blameless in his relationships. Verses 3 through 5, he does not slander with his tongue, he does no evil to his neighbor, does not take up reproach against a friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord, who swears to his own hurt and does not change, who does not put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. So just notice how in this description it encompasses several uh, different spheres of his life. In his personal relationships, he never slanders people with his tongue. He never does evil to his neighbors. In both word and action, he is the exact type of friend you want to have, right? Only ever operating out of pure motives to do good to others. Never once 
slandering someone, never once telling a story about someone in a one-sided way so that he looks better than he actually is, so that he looks like the hero. He doesn't ever gossip about his friends, blameless in speech and action. In the last line of verse 4, we're told that he takes an oath to his own hurt and doesn't change from what he says, meaning that his word is reliable and it's not self-serving. So if he promises that he's going to do something for somebody, and it turns out that that thing will be personally inconvenient or costly, he doesn't break his word in that moment to try to protect himself. Even in his business relationships, he won't use others to his own advantage. He doesn't put out money at interest or accept a bribe to make money at the expense of the innocent or the poor. He epitomizes the commandments to have a supreme love for God and a sacrificial love for others. And then finally, if we go back to verse 4 again, he is blameless in his affections, we could say, and what he honors in his affirmations. We could say it in different ways. But verse 4 again says, In whose eyes, in his eyes, a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord. And so what's David talking about here? I think generally speaking, he is describing spiritual discernment. His eyes and heart are so aligned with God's that the way God sees and defines good and evil, he shares that evaluation. What God calls good, he calls good. What God says this is evil and wicked and harmful, he says that's wicked and evil and harmful. And so the types of people, the types of lifestyles that he encounters, if God approves of it, he approves of it. If God disapproves of it, he disapproves of it. In both what we reject and celebrate, though, we share God's eyes and heart and evaluation. That's what he's talking about. To illustrate that one of the recurring points of contention, and you're like, yeah, it's not just recurring for you, it's recurring for us because you've had to hear about this stuff before, but it really, it, it's, it, it's a house divided in the Glazer home because of sports loyalties, okay? So just hang with me. I've mentioned a few of them before, and so I, I hate that you have to hear them, but, but it's come up again, especially during the postseason recently. If you ask my kids, though, what the universal rule is in the Glazer house, some of them, I think they've actually had to tell you it before. We never root for Alabama, all right? So... <laughs> Uh, being a Louisiana family and uh, having uh, our loyalties with Louisiana State University, uh, in our house, all things purple and gold are approved of, all right? But anything crimson is out, right? We don't want to look like the University of Alabama. So my kids in this way, they do a great job of sharing the heart and evaluation of their father. Like I, I can, I found them sometimes just saying Alabama with a little like scowl, you know, <laughs> just raising up the, the Lord's and the, the, the kids in the way of the Lord, of course. Uh, but they've put that to the test recently. And so for Joel in the hockey playoffs, he was rooting for the Carolina Hurricanes rather than the Boston Bruins. And it caused no shortage of um, discord in, in our house. Uh, nearly required some family counseling by the end of the series when Carolina won, and he celebrated in front of Jonah and me. Uh, for Jonah, he has his own ways that he's caused tension in the family. I mentioned this one before. He refuses to root for the Houston Astros and is a diehard Red Sox fan. Shame on you, you know? You guys have done this to him. I wish I could say I'm mature enough to, to handle this as, a, as an adult and a father sometimes, but, um, but it can cause some tension in there, especially when they get a little arrogant with it and start talking smack. But none of these betrayals in our house, even though they feel serious to me, none of them matter in the end, right? It's, it's, it's a trivial matter. I recognize not all my loyalties and affections are blameless and holy. Uh, I am an Astros fan after all. We don't have a good rep these days. But it is, when we think about the psalm, it is a most serious thing to affirm and celebrate and honor what our Father condemns and looks down upon, and vice versa, for us to dishonor and look down upon what our God has called good and holy and righteous, or those whom our Father loves. And so the righteous person described here shares the heart of God 
and honors those who fear the Lord and rejects the way of those who reject the Lord. And then the final statement concerning this righteous one is given at the end of verse 5. He who does these things shall never be moved. He won't be shaken, won't stumble, is rooted, immovable, and stable. And so now, just as we asked in Psalm 14, who is this fool? Now we need to ask, who is this righteous one? Who is the one in Psalm 15? And there's only one answer. There's only one person that perfectly fits the bill, right? This is Jesus. Read by itself, Psalm 15 uh, can, maybe could seem like this, but it's not a 10-step self-help guide for how one can make it into God's presence. Like, on the contrary, much like the Ten Commandments, it's a 10-foot ruler that says, we don't measure up to this. We have not lived according to this way. If these are the requirements to be in the presence of God, we are in serious trouble. Like David, we've failed to walk in integrity, to speak and think without blemish, to love our neighbor perfectly, to approve of righteousness and reject wickedness and live by the truth. But Jesus has no blemishes on his record. He never failed. He's perfectly blameless in his thoughts and words, actions and motives. His righteousness is perfect. His dwelling place is with the Father. And the good news of the gospel message is that Jesus, as the righteous one, has been offered as a sacrifice for us, for our sin, so that He might grant us His perfect righteousness, that He might grant us life in God's presence. I mentioned Romans 3 earlier, where Paul makes his case against humanity, but he's setting up the gospel that he delivers. And so listen now to how Paul's message powerfully summarizes what we encounter in Psalms 14 and 15. We'll pick up in verse 21 of Romans 3. Paul says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction Here's the inclusive language. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Verse 24, the good news. And are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. Friends, this is what Jesus has done for us. Every one of us have sinned, We have not done good on our own. We have turned aside. We have become corrupt. We have fallen short of God's glory. We deserve God's wrath as the wicked for for being the wicked fools that we are. But God, God by His grace sends His Son to bring about our redemption by living righteously in our place and becoming a propitiation, an atoning sacrifice for our sin. And in order to receive that gift, the sole requirement, qualification, is that we have repented and believed in Him, that we have trusted in Him. Were it not for Jesus, though, the opening question of Psalm 15, who will dwell with you, Lord, would be quickly answered with a simple, no one. (laughs) But because of Jesus, that answer for those who believe in Him is, we will dwell with the Lord. We sing often together, we will feast in the house of Zion because of what Jesus has done. So don't miss that today. First and foremost, before we move now into the the back end of this, behold the righteous king who has lived this out. Believe in him, the one who was perfect and punished for our sake. And then third, once we have believed in him, the call is to be like the king. Because we have believed in Jesus, we are also called to follow his example laid before us, what we see of this righteous king in Psalm 15. It's what Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 21, for to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. So like when we have snow on the ground and it's deep, like We finally had this year, and uh, my my kids can use my footprints in the snow. You know, they can walk behind you and have a a little bit easier pathway. 
Much more so, we as God's children are to follow Jesus' path and walk in his footsteps, to live as he lived. And so to that end, let's turn what we've seen of this righteous one in Psalm 15 into a few questions for our lives and our walk today. First question would be this. Are you following Jesus in the words that you believe and speak in your own heart? What we encounter in Jesus is one who not only is the truth and who not only is wisdom, but in his earthly life, we mentioned he modeled Psalm 1 to perfection. He delighted in God's instruction. He meditated on it day and night. And when Jesus was pressed, when he was, when he was squeezed, he is one who modeled a delight in and meditation upon the scriptures. That's what came out throughout every aspect of his life and ministry, in his youth, in his temptation, in his teaching, in his suffering, he speaks and bleeds the scriptures. And if the very word of God himself devoted himself so much to the scriptures, how much more do we need to be devoted to the word if we are to survive and live and follow his steps? And so we read the Word, we're called to study the Word, to meditate on the Word, not for our leisure, but for our very life. If we don't have it, we'll die. So that when we're pressed, when we're squeezed, when the enemy in the world shouts or whispers into our ears and into our hearts lies, in those moments that we will be those who speak the truth of God's word to our own hearts and to others. And so the call from this passage is devote yourself to the truth. Devote yourself to the word. Memorize it. Meditate on it. If you say, I want to do that, you don't know where to begin, one just easy way to start the summer is we have a church-wide challenge to just memorize Psalm 1, right? We've already introduced that with some of our kids, and we just encourage you to start there. Memorize the psalm teaching you, you need to memorize the rest of the scriptures, right? It's a good one to remember. And so devote this, store it up so that we speak truth and not lies to our own hearts. Second question then, are you following Jesus in your words and your actions towards others? And think of Jesus' track record. Not once did he slander someone with his tongue. Not once did he take up uh, evil or a reproach against his friend. Not once did Jesus say one thing out of one side of his mouth and then do another or say something else to someone. Not once did Jesus take advantage of someone for his own gain. He was blameless and spoke when he spoke to others. He's blameless when he spoke about others. Even though Jesus knew the depth of their wickedness, Jesus saw others with deep so we see in the Gospels, gut-level compassion. He feels it in his bowels. And he was sinless. We think if anyone has a reason to look down upon others and would be tempted to speak or act unlovingly towards them, we would think it'd be him, but he never does. Never once does he speak or act in a way that doesn't reflect a supreme love for his Father and a love for his people. And so once again, if that's true of Jesus' words and deeds, how much more urgent is it that we follow him in this way? Because we don't just live among the fools. We don't live among the wicked. We are, we were the wicked and the fools. We are the ill-deserving outside of Jesus. And yet we have received grace rather than punishment through him. We have heard from him words of life rather than words of condemnation. How quickly then should our lives and words towards others be marked by Christ's gentleness and his compassion, his charity, his mercy, his love. Those who have received great mercy will show great mercy to others. Those with whom God has been immensely patient and loving, we will be patient and loving with others. If we've received God's grace, we'll be gracious people. And so how are we doing with that? Let this be a a reminder and a call to follow Jesus' steps in this way. Third question then, are you following Jesus in what or who you celebrate 
and honor. For David and for Jesus, there is one way of life that is virtuous and praiseworthy, and that is a life that loves and fears and obeys the Lord above all else. And so when he sees people following that way of life, he honors and celebrates them. When people reject God, though, and live as if he isn't king and pursue all types of evil, he cannot celebrate that. Either way, though, he shares God's heart and character and evaluation. What God loves, he loves. What God despises, he despises. And so the call to follow Jesus' footsteps, then, is a call to share in his spiritual discernment. And, friends, it's not often going to be popular in a world that's foolish, according, again, to Psalm 14, in a culture that so regularly celebrates and promotes what God condemns across the board. There's no shortage of places that we could go to apply this and flesh it out at every turn in our world. It seems that the way of following Jesus is increasingly, at least in our context, it seems like it's increasing when others have dealt with this long before. The way of Jesus is recast as evil or hurtful, and the way of the fool is deemed virtuous and good and helpful. In pop culture, we know it's often the wicked or those who meet the definition of the fool who are idolized and who people seek to emulate. In the political realm, it's often those who exhibit the exact opposite of Psalm 15, (laughs) who rise to the top and exert massive power and influence. When it comes to relationships or issues of sexuality, it's seen as virtuous increasingly in our culture to affirm desires or lifestyles that are contrary to God's design for our good. While things like pursuing holiness or living in appropriate purity from Scripture are recast as oppressive or harmful. Even among Christians, we are often far more intrigued by the lives of celebrities and actors and athletes than we are about like the heroes of the faith and missionaries or even just the faithful brothers and sisters in our own congregation. The point, though, is that if we're not careful, what our world esteems as praiseworthy, we will share in that rather than having eyes that have been shaped by God's eyes and hearts that have been shaped by God's heart. What our world esteems as praiseworthy and what Jesus calls praiseworthy are rarely the same. And so a good test this week, just across the board, you do it with any number of issues, is when you find yourself either approving of something, celebrating it, or disapproving of it and rejecting it, would be to just ask the question, why? Right? Why do I see this thing as either honorable or dishonorable? And if the answer is because of my personal preferences, that's not, not great. <laughs> if it's just because of our cultural or social influences, again, we're, we're on dangerous ground there. Hopefully it's because either that thing honors God or that thing dishonors God, and therefore that's our evaluation of it. And so that's third. Are we celebrating and honoring what God does? And then a a final question that I would just ask as we wrap this up is, are we together living Psalm 15 out in a way that um, enables us to be a preview of Jesus's kingdom? of this community to come. One thought from Jim Hamilton's commentary on the Psalms this week really stuck with me. I've been thinking about it, and I wanted to put it up for us. It's worth our reflection together. This is what he writes, though. He says, if only those who live as Psalm 15 describes can sojourn in the Yahweh's tent and dwell on his holy mountain, think what kind of place that must be. Words that describe that fair and happy land include the following, safe, true, loving, kind, uninhibited. This would seem to be the kind of place where one could live naked and unashamed with no fear of being exploited or mocked or attacked, no fear of being a stumbling block or a distraction. And then he closes it out. He says, the kind of place where people live this way is the kind of place where the inhabitants have pure hearts 
and clean hands, where every motive is right, every thought righteous, and every impulse loving. I don't know about your experience in the world this week, but do you not long for that world? Man, what a world. And a couple thoughts in response to that then is to first realize that is exactly the world that we're headed for, friends. 2 Peter 3.13, but according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. No evil, no sin, no effects of sin there, no relational drama, no pain, just people who have been fashioned after the image of their Savior and perfected in love for God and for one another. And so remember, that's our destination. That's where we're going. And then uh, by way of response to that would be, is as we live now as a church in our local congregation, the call is to reflect that and pursue it now. We know we're not going to experience this new creation imagery in full until Jesus returns. But right now, this is the pattern and the goal and the type of community that we're called to be. We're to offer a preview both to one another and to our world of the kingdom of our Savior that is to come. A community where people speak truth to themselves and to one another. A community that does no evil to, an, to another, and a community where we speak no evil either to or of one another. A community that loves others perfectly and always seeks, in thought, word, and deed, their greatest good, the greatest good of others. A community that recognizes the destructive nature of evil and refuses to celebrate it. A community that loves the Lord and honors those who fear Him. A community that lives all of life as in the presence of God. That's the kind that we're going to live in, and that's the kind of community that God calls us to be, CBC. And so how would God have you take steps this week to facilitate that here, to foster that here, to follow his example and cultivate this type of community? Would you pray with me as we prepare to respond to this word? Father, we thank you that we can answer the question, who shall dwell with you in your tent and on your hill in a positive way because of Jesus. That we can say because he died and rose again and is resurrected in glory and reigning, we can dwell with you. We thank you for the eternal life we have now already in Jesus. That we get to know you and worship you love you, and that you've given us new hearts and placed your spirit in us so that we can walk in obedience to you. And Father, help us to pursue that even more now, that as we consider these two different paths, Father, that you would give us a renewed rejection of the way of foolishness that leads only into destruction. You would give us a, a renewed compassion to those that are walking that path now, recognizing that were it not for your sovereign grace, we would still be on that path. And so, Father, help us to live out the example that we've been given in Jesus, to trust in him as our substitute, and to follow him as our example. And guide us now, though, as we sing, as we, um, as we meditate on these words and think and ask you to work in our hearts and lead us to repentance and obedience to what you've called us to, Father. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen.